Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Spear, and I'm both a linguist and teacher by training. By profession, I'm an assistant professor of English and linguistics at Florida A&M University and an invited professor of linguistics at Universidad San Francisco de Quito in Ecuador. As a continuation of the workshop on special education through the Maestría en Enseñanza de Inglés como Segundo Idioma, I am so pleased to be able to have a conversation today with Mrs. Jenna Sterner, who was not only my best friend in first grade, but who also works as a teacher of the visually impaired. So without further ado, welcome Mrs. Sterner. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm so excited to be talking with you today. Um, and I can't wait to talk a little bit about what I do and the students I serve. Um, so yeah, I'm ready to go. Well, that sounds fantastic. So I was hoping maybe we could start by having you share with the viewers a little bit more about yourself. So who are you? Where are you from? What and where did you study? What exactly do you do? So again, my name is Jenna Sterner and I am a teacher of students with visual impairments and blindness. Um, that title can get changed um, here and there because it's kind of a mouthful. So a lot of times that title gets abbreviated and uh, we will refer to ourselves as TSVIs. Sometimes we're just referred to as a TVI, a teacher of the visually impaired. Um, sometimes it's easier for school districts and teams to refer to me as the vision support teacher, almost like a learning support teacher. So I have I have that title. So I, I go by many different names. Um, uh, and I'm currently one of 13 TVIs serving both Lancaster and Lebanon counties in Pennsylvania in the United States. Um, I have a dual bachelor's degree in elementary education for pre-K to four, as well as a special education degree for specifically for the visually impaired. Um, and that covers students from birth through 21 years of age. So I am certified to teach um, people who are visually impaired um, from the time they're born to the, you know, time they're 21 years old. Um, and I received this degree from Cutstown University and that's in Pennsylvania. That's really interesting that you said 21. If I could just ask sort of a, a quick follow-up, does that mean that you also perhaps could work with adult students at a community college or at a university or in some kind of community education? I, I could. And a lot of times what happens when um, a student is covered under um, an IEP, they are actually able to continue school um, past the age of 18 until they're 21. So that kind of just covers students under an IEP who decide they want to stay in school until the age of 21. Okay, excellent. And this is a great use of IEP, particularly because it's something we've covered in the, the workshop as well. Something we haven't covered, however, is sort of the nitty gritty. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping I could ask you sort of briefly to describe for us what exactly a visual impairment is, and perhaps maybe some of the biggest misunderstandings or misconceptions about what it means to actually have a visual impairment. I would love to, because this is something we address consistently in our field. Um, so basically when a person has a visual impairment, this means that vision cannot be corrected to normal with the use of glasses or contacts. So you and I are both wearing glasses now. Um, we're not vis considered visually impaired because our glasses are correcting our vision to typical or to normal. Um, so the degree and severity of visual impairments can vary drastically from person to person. There's hundreds of different diagnoses and um, it can range from very moderate or mild vision loss to profound or severe. Um, some students are born completely without their eyeballs and some you know, have less se severe diagnosis. So it just really depends on the, the unique person. Um, the term visual impairment, and this is something I'm very passionate about, can also include people who have suffered uh, damage to their visual cortex, which is in the brain. Um, and in these cases, a person's eyes are completely healthy, completely normal, quote unquote normal, <laughs> but the impairment stems from damage to the brain, where the brain is no longer able to process visual information. So that presents a whole new set of unique challenges um, uh, and should be should be addressed extremely differently than how we might address um, a student that has uh, an ocular 
visual impairment versus a brain-based visual impairment. So that's how we separate those two. Um, you, uh, students either have a brain-based visual impairment or um, an ocular visual impairment. Interesting. So, um, the, so the common, you asked about common misconceptions, and I think the most common misconception about people who are visually impaired, um, I think people always go to, I think a, someone that's visually impaired has a cane and they read braille. So um, you're used to kind of that stereotype of, you know, the sunglasses, the cane, um, and that is oftentimes not the case. And it's very frequently not the case that um, a, a student who is visually impaired would have a cane or sunglasses or even read Braille. Um, we often refer to visual impairment as a hidden disability, which means it's difficult to tell whether someone has a visual impairment just by looking at them. Um, it's often very subtle. Um, you, there might not be any outward signs of a visual impairment. Um, and not all people who are visually impaired read Braille. Uh, many people with visual impairments are considered low vision. And um, this might just mean that they use large print for their learning media instead of Braille. So I think that's the main one. Um, and that can be tricky for our people who are visually impaired when they're requesting accommodations because we have had students people just come up to students and say, well, you're not blind because you don't use a cane and really just, you know, that's an inappropriate comment, but that is a very common misconception. Well, and that's a, a of course, like you said, um, sort of a very inappropriate and difficult comment, right. I imagine, for everyone to hear who's involved. Do you find that there is a lot of stigma surrounding individuals with visual impairments? I think there is, and I think um, as a teacher of the visually impaired, um, that's one of the things I teach for our students is to sort of, I, it, it's hard because you can't ever prepare someone for a comment like that, but we do work really hard on self-advocacy with our students um, and how to address a situation like that and how to react in a situation like that. Um, we we work on a lot, for a lot of my students, we we, I have them prepare a script that they actually present to people when they're trying to ask for an accommodation, especially out in the community where it's, again, not as understood. So that's really important for our students to build those skills um, because uh, it's just a part of life, unfortunately. That's not always a great one. And the, the uh, people with visual impairments have all kinds of obstacles to, to overcome, and that's definitely one of them. Right. And, and I was thinking, I remember years ago when I had first started teaching K-12. Now, I'm, I'm not elementary. I was secondary mm -hmm. ed, so 7 through 12. And it's been a couple years now since I was in that classroom. But I remember hearing students talk about teachers, uh, you know, the deaf teacher or the blind teacher, not referring to a quality of that teacher, but rather towards the students with whom he or she worked. And that's right. what sort of sparked my interest here in whether this stigma is still um, if not widespread, still something that you witness or you've heard from students. It is. And we really try, again, we try to use that person, even the language that's associated. Uh, we really try to focus on person first language and make sure that, um, we're identifying, you know, teachers as teachers first or students as students first. And that's just, it seems very like, like a very small thing to focus on, but um, language can have such a huge impact. Um, and it's important that we start somewhere as we're bringing awareness. I am so, so happy you mentioned that because the very first part of the workshop focused specifically on people first language, right? Awesome. This idea that it might not be the most effective use of language to talk about, um, you know, the blind student or the deaf student. Or, um, you know, there are certainly other terms that have historically been used and sometimes in a very informal way used colloquially, uh, despite the pejoratives. Exactly. And um, a person's disability doesn't define them and shouldn't be um, the first, first identifying factor for them. Um, exactly. There's so much more to that person, right? Exactly. Great. So you had you had mentioned this word accommodations once or twice earlier. And so this is sort of the perfect segue for us, because one of our goals here um, is to raise awareness, not only on special education more broadly 
on the legislative changes within Ecuador, but the ways that we can most effectively prepare teachers to work with students who have, um, you know, particular disabilities or who need certain kinds of additional supports and scaffolding. So I'm wondering, what exactly does it mean to be a teacher of the visually impaired? What does a typical day for you actually look like, right? You mentioned working in a lot of these different schools over for, you know, a large geographical area, which our viewers might not be familiar with. Uh, but let's say we're talking about the entire province of Pichincha, right? It's a very large area. So what does a typical day look like for you? What does it mean for you to be a teacher of the visually impaired? And what kind of accommodations, modifications, and interventions are available for your students? Sure. So I will start by saying that as a teacher of a visually impaired, you can either be an itinerant teacher, so a teacher that travels to your students, or you can work at a school for the blind. I am an itinerant teacher of the visually impaired, so my day involves a ton of driving. Uh, I drive a lot. Um, but actually in Pennsylvania, we have de decent drive times. Um, if you go down into the Southern states, some of the, some of the itinerant teachers of the visually impaired in those states are driving somewhat, sometimes up to 200 miles per day. Um, mm -hmm. So okay. it depends on your caseload numbers. It depends on, you know, a lot of factors, uh, geographic area, um, but a lot of travel for an itinerant teacher of the visually impaired. Uh, so when a school district has a student um, with uh, uh, concerns for vision. Um, they will put in a request for services and they submit that to the intermediate unit that I work for. And then that is them requesting my services to come out and typically do uh, an evaluation. Okay. So, um, and again, visual impairment is considered a low incidence disability, which means there's there typically isn't a high concentration of students with visual impairments in one location. Um, they're spread out over, like you said, a large geographic area, um, unless they're unless they go to a school for the blind. Um, for people who are blind and visually impaired, see, even there you have to break as we often refer to them for schools for the blind, but even that language has to change. But anyway, uh, so. Again, this requires a lot of travel because they are spread out, but we will typically travel to the school, do an evaluation, and that evaluation uh, does a couple things for us. First, a student has to meet a certain um, criteria for, for qualifying as a student of, with a visual impairment, um, and that's a variety of factors. And really, in Pennsylvania, if you have any visual condition that is impacting your educational progress or your access, visual access to your materials, you are considered a student with a visual impairment. Um, so we come out and we do a functional vision assessment and that's just a TVI saying um, how much vision or how much useful vision does the student have. And then we also do a learning media assessment. Uh, and that tells us, okay, so the student has a visual impairment which type of media is going to be most appropriate for the level of vision that they have. So that could either be large print, that could be braille, that, uh, that could be um, some auditory um, channels that they're using to access information or a combination of both. And we often refer to learning media um, in primary learning media, secondary learning media. So for example, for a typical Braille student, their primary learning media would be Braille. And then a lot of times their listening skills have to be so, um, so great that that actually becomes a secondary learning channel for them. Um, so that's important too. Um, so we do a lot of evaluating. Um, I also, um, as part of that evaluation, I will be requesting eye reports and I will be summarizing those for uh, people who aren't as familiar with visual impairments. Uh, so any teacher, parent, uh, we summarize those eye reports for them to help, help um, everybody understand the visual impairment a little bit better um, and the impacts of the visual impairment. Um, we also, obviously, I will make recommendations for accommodations for the students. So again, an accommodation is really just a change in the way that something is typically done to suit the needs of, of a student. So we make 
a ton of recommendations for the student. Um, we also uh, prepare IEP goals. So that's really, well, what are we gonna teach the student because they have a visual impairment? What are the skills that they need because they have a visual impairment? Uh, so we have to do those types of um, things. And then a, a major thing that I do on a daily basis is material adaptation. So I'm doing a lot of brailing. Uh, I'm doing a lot of uh, tactile graphics and tactile charts. Um, I'm also doing a lot of braille transcription. So if a student brails something, uh, I would, they would submit it to me and I would transcribe it. So I would basically decode it for the teacher so that they know what it says. And then I would hand it back to the teacher um, so that they can effectively assess the student. Um, and then there's a whole technology piece. Uh, technology for people who are blind and visually impa impaired has come a, a, a very long way. And um, I'm often teaching uh, my students how to use electronic braille readers, how to use uh, video magnifiers. Uh, so that's also part of my instruction on a daily basis. Um, and yeah, just those common accommodations for students with visual impairments, uh, a lot of braille um, and tactile graphics. But again, as I said before, not everybody's a braille reader. So we often uh, do a lot of large print materials for our students. Proximity of seating is a very common accommodation uh, for someone that is visually impaired because it's typical that they might not be able to see at a great distance. And again, going back to those brain-based visual impairments, we focus on decreasing the sensory complexity or decluttering the learning environment because that actually helps to make it easier for a student with a brain-based visual impairment to process their surroundings. So again, in the world of education, it's very common to, especially in elementary education, to decorate the room with all these bright colors and you know, make it very, you know, fun and exciting. And while I do, you know, I do understand that for people with brain-based visual impairments, those types of decorations can make it near impossible to focus on the actual information that they need to be focusing on. Um, so I work with a lot of teams on how to decrease that clutter in the environment and then balance the complexity of the environment to the complexity of the task. Um, so that's all that's that's my I, again I could go on and on but those are probably the main points of uh, what I do on a daily basis well you've you've mentioned so many really interesting and cool things there that I have so many follow-ups but I actually want to start with one um, that might seem a little aggressive I'm going to play devil's advocate here uh, so in Ecuador Okay. There has historically been a tradition of sending students with any kind of disabilities to their own schools. Okay. Right. So complete segregation. Um, historically, over the last 10 to 15 years, however, there's been a push towards more inclusive behavior. Now, we don't find full mainstreaming, full inclusion in most schools yet. But what would you say to somebody in the community who says, yeah, but if you have one student in the class with a brain-based visual impairment who is distracted by these colors and all these fun things on the walls, why do all of the other 25 students have to go without? That is a good question. And I will follow up by saying we get confronted with that dilemma a lot in our field. Um, it still comes up. People still ask why our students aren't going to a special school for the visually impaired. That's even coming up here. Um, I would say now, I don't know, you know, other people's opinions, but there can be pros and cons to both. Like I said, here we have both. We have students who are visually impaired who are included in, you know, the regular education setting with, you know, typical peers, quote unquote. Um, and then we do have schools that are specially designed for everyone that goes there has a visual impairment. So I do think there's some pros and cons to both. I would say that the benefit of including students with visual impairments, uh, one, other students get to kind of experience someone with um, 
with a, that type of disability. And I think it's important for other people who don't have visual impairments or other disabilities to interact with people who had that different perspective. So I think it's important for other people to um, be involved with others that have different disabilities. Um, I also uh, think it's really um, important to include students with visual impairments um, in the classroom because if we go back to that, well, why should why should we change this for everyone else? A lot of these things can be considered universal design. So if you are making an accommodation, a lot of times it could be an accommodation that benefits everyone. So I see that too. I try to push that to a lot of my teams. Like, hey, if you're doing it for this student, it might work. It might work fine for all of your other students. Now. Obviously, that doesn't work for everything. Um, but again, like I said, there are pros and cons because uh, I do think a school for the, the blind serve a great purpose because it does make the student feel connected to someone else. Because a lot of times our students are the only person in their class, sometimes the only person in their entire school that has a visual impairment. Um, and there's negative side effects to that as well. So I'm not sure I have a great answer for that because I do see the pros and cons in both. Um, but I do uh, think it is important for students with visual impairments to be included in the regular ed setting with, I don't even like this word, but typical typically functioning peers, um, because it is more realistic to how they would enter the real world. And that's why I think it's important. Because once they leave that school for school for the blind, or school for people with visual impairments, they're going out into the real world where, again, they may not encounter anyone else with a visual impairment. Um, so I think it's important just for the, the advocacy piece for our students to be involved and included. Well, I love the way you answered that because I, I asked you a deliberately provocative, unanswerable <laughs> question, right? Somebody will be offended regardless of the way that you answer. Um, and I, you know, I am a proponent of full inclusion. I don't know if I ever told you this or not, but my twin brother had a, a learning disability in terms of reading comprehension and always had an IEP. Same with my siblings, both of them did. So. Right. And so, I mean, I think he had a, a markedly different experience in classes where he was included, where he didn't feel like the, let's say, shortcoming. I even think that's okay. a very odd way of wording it. But let's say the <laughs> shortcoming prevented him from appearing the same as mm -hmm. everyone else or, you know, in, in the more typical uh I guess, no pun intended, but the more typical mm -hmm. nomenclature, a typically functioning student. You're right. I mean, you've, you've raised a lot of really interesting questions here just about the language usage, and I don't know how we get around it. But the reason I mention this is because when I, before I left K-12, I had IEP meetings every quarter for about five to six students, and I loved them because mm -hmm. these were students who typically were considered less than they were defined by the disability, whichever uh, disability it was. And it was an opportunity for me to sit around and gloat, to talk about how great this student is and be a real advocate in a way that I feel like a lot of students with IEPs typically don't have yeah. an advocate, but I was at a single school. So what I'm wondering is, as an itinerant teacher, are you privy to these conversations for IEPs? Are you sitting in on meetings? Are you required to go? Or do you just make the recommendations, keep your fingers crossed, and hope that they implement some? So I would say for any student that's visually impaired, I would be a required. If I have evaluated a student and identified them as a student with a visual impairment, people would not have a meeting without me, an IEP meeting. Um, a lot of times, if a student only has a visual impairment and that's their only disability, I am the IEP case manager for that student. So I would write the entire IEP. I would write all the IEP goals. I would be in charge of setting up the meeting and inviting the regular ed teacher, possibly the principal, the parent, anyone involved with that student. Uh, yes, I am very involved in the IEP process. Um, and a lot of times at those meetings, I am acting as an advocate for those students, because a lot of time, at times at those meetings, I have to handle those questions. Well, from teachers, 
through no fault of their own, teachers have so much pressure on them right now. And then to add, you know, oh, I have to make all these extra accommodations and I have to do all these extra things. And, you know, they're feeling like they're not having the support from an administrative level. Um, I feel for those teachers, um, but I, it is my job to advocate for the student and their needs because at the end of the day, that's where they're going to school and they need to be provided for. So a lot of what I do in IEP meetings is, working it out with teachers, compromising with teachers, supporting them as much as I can. A lot of times when I get thrown into the mix, teachers are worried. They look at me like I'm going to cause them more work. And they often do, they often do, but I, I try to reframe that a little bit and say, you know, my job is to make your job easier working with a student. Um, so I am, again, I go back to that vision support. I am there to support not only the student, but the teachers working with the student as well, especially if you have a Braille student. So a lot of times the teachers who are very overwhelmed because when I have a Braille, when I have a, a student that is reading Braille, I have to get all the materials a week in advance from the teachers. So, you know, that is an overwhelming piece for teachers because it's just, it takes some turnaround time to get those materials submitted and then brailled and then back in the hands of the student um, by the time that they need it. So um, that's, that's really tough for, you know, teachers to, when they first learn about it, to get on board with. And it, again, it is, it is unfortunately extra work um, but it's so important for the student and it means so much to the student. I love that line. My job is to make your job easier. I really yeah. like that. And I can understand why submitting materials a week in advance might be difficult, particularly because, you know, for somebody like me at the post-secondary level, yeah. sometimes I go, what am I doing tomorrow? Oh exactly. yeah. I remember what I'm doing tomorrow because I've taught it 10 to 15 times before, but if I have to do that a week in advance, I need to know where approximately we're going to end in advance as well. We're planning. And, you know, we, I, you know, we should be planning, but unfortunately, you know, there's so many factors that go into the inability to, you know, plan that far ahead. Curriculum's always changing. Um, and one of the main things that teachers say is, oh my goodness, I just feel like I can't be as flexible as I want, as I want to be. And, and I, I do, I feel, I feel for teachers, but again, I always um, tell teachers, Hey, you know, they got their listening ears on for the most part. And now there's, you know, other factors that may limit, you know, their ability to hear. And, but there's always, a, I feel like there, where there's a will, there's a way, there's always a way for students to get those things, you know, accomplished um, in a variety of ways. And I, I love, um, the idea of having tools in their toolbox. Um, so making sure that they have a variety of tools and strategies um, and some might work better for other tasks. Um, it's just kind of figuring out what, what works best in each individual situation, so. Yeah. You you are so Pennsylvanian, their tools in their toolbox. I use the, Ooh, same, I <laughs> the same wording myself. You got to open up your toolbox and bring out all those strategies and tools that you have as a reader and a writer. I exactly. love it. So I know that you've mentioned that most of these students, or at least a significant number of them, are not actually learning how to use and read Braille. But you have mentioned Braille a couple times now. So I'm wondering sort of a quick and dirty version. How does Braille even work? I mean, how, how do you print these books and how do you read it and what does it look like? And, oh, there's so many. So, so there's a couple of different ways you, a student can obtain a Braille material. So um, first, the district has to submit the material that's needed for the student in print. So um, that gets submitted. If, if it's a textbook, we collect that textbook prior to the end of the previous school year and it gets submitted to the state. And the state has a whole team of braille transcribers and they their sole purpose is to take these textbooks and scan them into a computer and put them into the braille software program and then emboss these textbooks and send them back to us. It takes an enormous amount of time to get a textbook brailled. It is very costly for the state. It is very, it's just, the, it's a laborious process. Um, so that's one way we try to submit to the state uh, for um, textbooks. Um, at the I, at our intermediate unit, IU 13, we have a Braille specialist 
a material specialist. So we have two people actually working at the IU and their sole job is to get things that we've been submitted that have been submitted to the TVI that needs to be done and we will we will send it to them and they're like our backup. And then for short sure, for and then I'll also have material prep built into my day. Um, so it'll go through me. I figure out what I can do with my material prep time. And if I can't, if it's a lot and I can't get that done, then I then I uh, shift it to my material specialist at the IU. Um, and then textbooks typically go to the state. Now that varies across the board for even within Pennsylvania, some some intermediate units. Um, they don't have a material specialist. And at some other, in some other states, the TVI is the only one doing any material prep right. at all. So um, the Braille is actually, so there's a couple of ways you can actually emboss the Braille. We have an old fashioned typewriter looking Braille writer, and that's very old fashioned. It takes a lot of time to Braille something that way. Um, now with all the technology, I actually have a program on my computer called Braille 2000 and you can type print into that and then you just click a little button and it turns it into Braille format and you send it to the embosser, which is like a, a printer for Braille and it prints it out. So that's a, lo a lot faster. And uh, what's nice for uh, some of my students, they have electronic Braille devices. And that device can actually connect to an iPad and um, I can actually upload, like if you use Google Drive, I can create Google documents and that, that iPad and that electronic Braille display talk to each other through Bluetooth and um, it's instant translation into Braille um, for that device. So, uh, yeah. When, when you say for that device, what, what exactly do you mean? Does it print it from that device or... So there's actually a there's actually a display on the electronic braille device, and there are little pins underneath. Like so, there's okay. Let me back up because I'll explain the braille cell. So a braille cell is made up of six dots, and um, words are created through a combination of cells, and um, letters are created uh, through different combinations of these dots. Um, so it's kind of complicated, but I can I can even provide you with a chart at some point because it's really just more like a code. A lot of people say it's like a language, but it's more like a code. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the display on the electronic Braille device has, um, it varies from device to device, but they typically have 18 Braille cells in a row. And then um, there's little pins underneath them that pop up and create the different um, combinations of dots for each cell um, to, to basically allow the student to um, have the Braille continue to change as they're reading through a document. That is fascinating. It, 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 is, it is amazing, the technology that, that is available to students that today. You're definitely going to have to share a picture with me of that. I mean, that sounds fantastic. I'm see if I can find it real quick and share my screen. One second, so I can get an image up real quick. Sorry, I should have been pre prepared. No, Let that's that's perfectly fine. I mean, you know, you can ask any of my students over the last eight to ten years here. They have no idea what I'm going to ask, so there's no way, <laughs> no way to. So I will share my screen. Okay. If I can make you a co-host. Um, yeah. Let me see. Okay. Let me see if I can share screen, and I'm gonna show and share. Can you see what I'm? Can you see my screen? I can. That okay. looks like yeah. alien technology. It is. So this is a really fun device called the Orbit Reader, and uh, you can see at the top. There's six buttons, and each of those buttons corresponds to a dot in the Braille cell. Okay. Um, and depending on which combination of dots you put in, it creates a letter or a braille contraction. Um, and then there's a space bar, um, the arrow keys and the select key in the center here. Mm -hmm. Those would actually help you navigate um, through a document on the iPad or even on a computer. These can connect to a computer or an iPad uh, via Bluetooth. And then here is that display. So there's these little pins at the bottom mm -hmm. in each of these cells. And so each cell would cre create a Braille symbol. 
for the student. And then these are called the panning keys. And if you're reading text, you would use these to pan through each line of text. Aha, uh -huh, okay. So that is, yeah, that is a very fascinating device. Now this is a very short display. I think this is, it's Orbit Reader 20. So there's 20 cells here. Um, and then some for very advanced uh, college bound students, there can be up to 40 cells on an electronic braille device. They're a lot bigger. And okay. as long as more, as long as a keyboard on a computer. So, yeah. Oh, cool. that is. I can show you real quick a traditional braille writer. Yes, please. Uh, I have some more things up. So, this is the old school. This is the typewriter you were talking about. Yeah, this is um, a, the traditional Perkins Brailler. Oh, it's really big. Um, and you can kind of see it sort of mimics the Orbit Reader with the six keys at the bottom mm -hmm. and the space bar in the middle. And then I wish it would have different, some different views. Let's see. This is of the Perkins website. Uh, no, no pictures on here. So yeah, that is just one. You can kind of see it a little bit better. It's back, backed up here, but right. you would drill down here at the paper, sort of you load the paper in at the top, like a, a traditional typewriter and um, it, you can, yeah. That is a very long way to do it though. And it, you can't, you really fix mistakes if you make them. So I cannot tell you how many times I've brailled things and had to start all over because I made a mistake in my braille and. <laughs> had to scratch it out and <laughs> redo it. So it's much easier to do it through the software. Well, and I can imagine the paper is probably different as well. Is it thicker? Is it larger? Yes, that's a good question. So it is thicker. It's a heavier weight paper um, because it has to withstand um, the, the embosser head mm -hmm. and um, it has to make an impression on the paper. So if you put a regular piece of, you know, standard printer paper in there, it would just, the embosser head would rip right through it. Okay. And because Braille is sort of a tactile orthography, it's raised from the paper, correct? As opposed yeah. to being behind, it's from the, so when it's printed, it would almost have to be printed from the back, I would guess? It's hard to expl explain because you can actually have double-sided Braille. The embosser has settings to make it, make it that way. So it could, it could go either way to make it double-sided. Um, it kind of just flips it over, but I get, yeah, it, it's actually doing it from the front. So the embosser head presses down on top of the paper. So it is actually on top. I feel like my head is going to explode. I have, I did not anticipate learning this much about- oh, not, Learning not, a lot. Like not, I said, I could go on and on. <laughs> I know this, this is amazing. I mean, what I, what I'd like to do is I just have sort of one final question for you and, and it might actually be the biggest question. Sure. So this is of course a workshop for teachers and these conversations are ancillary materials so that, you know, our attendees can continue learning. They can hear from actual experts, right? I mean, if we're talking about linguistics, I'm the guy. If we're talking about English in middle and high school, I'm the guy. But when it comes to special education, and in particular, in your case, visual impairments, I'm not the guy. So what I'd like, what I'd like you to do is this. I want you to imagine that you're in charge of your own workshop, and you're speaking with teachers about you know, teaching students with disabilities, having them in the classroom, in particular those with visual impairments, what kind of things would you say or recommend to them? What kind of advice would you impart? This might sound like kind of a basic answer to this, but I really think this is so important because it is so important because students with visual impairments or really, like you said, any disability, there is no one size fits all accommodation list that would you know, serve that entire population. Um, even my students, I can tell you out of, I've been working for doing this for nine years, going on nine years now. And I have never had one student one student be the same as another. They're all different and they all need different things. Yes, they are all considered students with visual impairments, but they all have such unique and different needs and their instruction and their learning environment needs to be tailored to them specifically. So I think 
I think we wish there was a one size fits all, like this is what we do for everyone that has a visual impairment. And that's just not the case. And I have the luxury of only working with one student at a time. And that makes it really easy for me to zero in on my students and their unique needs. Um, but I know that's not the case for everyone, but I do, I would encourage teachers to uh, look at each student individually and on a case by case basis so that they can make the most appropriate accommodations for that student. Um, it just helps them succeed so much more in the classroom if they're looked at as an individual. Um, even though we want them to be included, it's really important to recognize their individual unique needs. So that's where that gray area happens when we go back to that question of like, okay, is it best that they're included or, you know, and you know, with my kiddos, they spend some one-on-one -on -one time with me, one-on-one, -on -one, and then they head back to the classroom and they're included. So it doesn't have to be one or the other sometimes. It's sometimes they need a little bit of both. So um, I do think it's important to just recognize those uh, unique needs and tailor your instruction to fit. Uh, based on the unique need of the student. I think this is a, a really beautiful, thoughtful way for us to come sort of full circle, you know, because you, you mentioned people first language as well. And yes, I mean, some labels are meaningful. They help us recognize these meaningful differences and then provide the kinds of supports that we need to, uh, both ethically and legally. But there is, of course, always more to an individual than perhaps a visual impairment. And so I, I really love that you're, you're noting here that we have to look at each of these students individually and figure out what is best for this student uh, as opposed to what is best for all of these students as sort of one large group. Exactly. And just recognizing the individual needs of the student might not even be related to their diagnosed disability. I mean, having a disability comes along with so much that it can actually affect, you know, their social, social emotional needs and those types of things. Like, and we don't always think about that, especially me. I sometimes have a one track mind, you know, I've been doing this so much, but, you know, for example, I just had a little girl on caseload who's going to lose her vision. And for me, Braille is my everyday, but, you know, she really taught me to stop and recognize the emotional trauma of losing vision and having it and being fearful of losing it. And um, I think that's an important piece too, that we have to recognize that, uh, all of the baggage that comes along with having any type of disability, whether it's a visual impairment or any other type. Um, and that's why it's so important to look at the person and the whole person and how, you know, other parts of their lives might be affected by, you know, what their challenges are. So. Well, you know, Mrs. Sterner, I just want to take a moment here to thank you for taking all your, your time and sharing it with us today, all of your experience here. I mean, I know I'm not alone when I say that I have learned so incredibly much more than I thought I was going to <laughs> in this conversation, not because I think I'm an expert, I am not, but I was not prepared for the sheer wealth of the knowledge that has come with those years of experience. So thank you very much for taking the time to, to share with us everything that you've learned from your students and through your formal training. It has been my pleasure. I'm so happy to be a part of, you know, you know spreading awareness. It's so important um, for people to know these things and be aware, at least be aware. And um, I think that's part of what I hope that this workshop does for people, other people. I agree completely. Thank you again.